Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Christine Muir. I'm the community librarian at Cary Library. I was just telling Jonathan I've been there just over three years now. So it's been a fun and exciting time. And, and this is fun and exciting new things for us. I'd like to thank anyone who's ever donated to our foundation as they support all of our programming at the library, and especially now that it's gone virtual. We have some new tools and technology that we're using. I am recording tonight's program, uh, and it will be posted to our YouTube channel within the next day or two. So I'm excited to introduce tonight Jonathan Haber to talk about critical thinking, especially during an election and a pandemic season. Jonathan is a Lexington-based educational researcher and consultant and the author of Critical Thinking Essentials from MIT Press. He's also the creator of the website Logic Check, which analyzes the reasoning behind the news of the day. Jonathan will talk about the concept of critical thinking, where it originated, what critical thinking skills are, and how they can be taught, learned, practiced, and applied to any issue or decision by people of any age. We will have time for discussion throughout the presentation. Jonathan will stop on occasion and check in to see if anybody has any questions, and we will have some time for discussion and more questions at the end of the program. If you have any questions or technical issues that you don't want to address verbally or on screen, you are welcome to use the chat feature and I will be monitoring that all night to answer any questions that, that may come up um, that maybe don't have to be shared publicly. So with that, I will turn this over to Jonathan. Hey, thanks, Christine. And um, thanks to everybody who joined tonight. This is actually the uh, Second time I've given a, given a presentation on this topic here for Cary Library, and it's um, really enjoyable to um, be able to get the chance to to talk about it during such an important time, during a time when critical thinking or thinking uh, critically about important topics is sometimes hard to do, but all the more necessary to do. So just as my background, I think Christine mentioned, I'm um, an author. I've written um, actually uh, Two books for MIT, a book on massive open online courses, and the most recent book on critical thinking. The logiccheck.net site is a site I created that is similar to fact checking sites, but it checks the reasoning, the logic behind the news. And a uh, new book, it actually was an old book, but there's a new edition coming out in about a week's time called Critical Voter that I'll be using for examples during this talk. Uh, the Critical Voter is more of a how to guide for learning critical thinking skills, and he uses election politics as a case study to teach critical thinking. Uh, but I want to start with the book that Christine mentioned, which is uh, Critical Thinking Essentials. This one is less of a how-to guide, and is more of a book designed to dispel a set of myths. I think there are a number of how-to guides and textbooks about critical thinking, but none have really gotten at the nut of why has it been such a struggle to make critical thinking part of our education system and beyond that part of our, our lives as parents, as citizens. Um, so this book really takes on three myths. One is that we don't know what critical thinking is. We, we have a lack of definition. Another is we don't know how to teach critical thinking or if, even if it can be taught. And then another one, we don't have a way of evaluating, a way of measuring improvement critical thinking skills. Now, when I gave this presentation, um, Earlier in the year, I focused on um, the first two. Uh, today, I want to focus on the first one and then provide more sort of how-to tips, which I think people were saying they would have liked more of last time. But if anybody's an educator and wants to talk more about uh, how critical thinking is, is best taught and evaluated, there'll be, as Christine said, there'll be plenty of free time, for time at the end for Q&A, and we could, we could ask questions during the talk also. But just to get into sort of like, what is critical thinking? Because it's a term that sort of everyone knows we need more of it. You know, teachers all claim it's their top priority. And probably if you got 10 people in a room, they couldn't come up with a common definition. And I think that's why there's this sort of belief that we don't know what it is, uh, coupled with, I think, a, uh, something that slows us down by thinking without knowing what it is, which really means without a sort of common wording of a definition, 
the critical thinking project can't go forward. And that's the myth I wanted to dispel. And I did it by sort of taking a genealogical approach to the concept, right? Um, where did the concept originate? There, there's this form of thinking that is unique enough to be called critical, right? It's distinct from intellect, it's distinct from wisdom. There's some unique thing called critical thinking. And in fact, it sort of draws from a number of fields. This is why some people think critical thinking is, is very ancient because it draws on, for instance, philosophy. So particularly uh, ancient Greek philosophy. So 2,500 years of history that it draws on, but also draws on science, particularly sort of pre-modern science, the early era where kind of science was really not distinct from philosophy. Uh, that informed the critical thinking construct. More recently, we've got psychology, particularly psychology as a science, which is less than a couple hundred years old, education as a field, younger still, and most recently cognitive science, understanding how the brain works. Okay, so these are all fields that have informed the construct, the concept of critical thinking. But in fact, critical thinking has an origin point. We can actually pinpoint exactly when sort of critical thinking became its own distinct thing. And that, that year was 1910. That was a year that John Dewey, who many of you may know, was probably one of the most uh, important American intellectuals of the 20th century, uh, particularly in the area of education. He wrote a book uh, called Democracy and Education, uh, quite famous. But previous to that, he wrote a book called How We Think. And in that book, he defined something called reflective thinking as active, persistent, and careful consideration of any belief or supposed form of knowledge in the light of the ground that supports it and further conclusion to which it tends. Okay. And this was the first definition of he called it reflective thinking, but it eventually became critical thinking. And all discussion of critical thinking in the last 110 years have really been in dialogue with Dewey's original definition. Now, those definitions have gone in different directions. I, I list a number of them in, in, in the uh, MIT book. Uh, but, you know, they, they even while the wording may be different, there may be actual substantive um, kind of, of differences between them, they really all can be contained in a um, three-part model that I'm sort of illustrating here. Critical thinking, however you want to sort of word it, really is a set of knowledge, skills, and dispositions taken together, right? To take a, an example, in order to be a critical thinking, you need to structure your thinking. So it means you need to understand some form of logic. It doesn't have to be any particular form of logic. Uh, you could be informal logic or symbolic logic or one of the methods for diagramming logic. It doesn't have to be any particular form of logic, but you do need to be able to, you do need to understand, you need to have knowledge of some logical system, right? But that's not enough. You also have to be good at applying it, particularly since uh, the number of situations you have to apply logic to can be very vast, right? An editorial, a newspaper ad, a discussion you're having at work, a, an argument you're having with loved ones. Okay, so you need the skills to put that logical, those logical um, principles to work. And finally, you need dispositions, right? It's no good if you're, you know, get all A's in your logic class and you're terrific at applying it to all kinds of things. If you don't want to apply it to, for instance, something you already agree with, you know, because it, it's, you've always believed that, right? You don't want to subject your own sort of, of ideas to challenge through sort of logical rigor, then you can't be a critical thinker, right? Because you're not using, you don't have the dispositions for it, but take it all three together. And there's other skills I'll be getting into, but knowledge of logic, skills of logic, the willingness to put logic to use, and then with all the other skills taken together, that's what it means to be a critical thinker. So, so what are those skills? And the reason I'm using the critical voter to illustrate this one is these are the skills that are covered in critical vote, voter, uh, not just structured thinking, you know, commonly referred to as logic, but also language skills, um, argumentation, background knowledge, right? You can't really um, have a good argument about something or think logically about something if you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but also things that not everybody considers um, central critical thinking skills, but, but I, I, I happen to be in the camp that thinks persuasive communication, commonly referred to as rhetoric, is an important critical thinking skill because often some of the translation we have to do, um, and I'll be giving you an example in a second, is requires you to sort of peer through rhetoric and sort of get to the logical core of an argument beneath it. Um, and as I mentioned, dispositions, what are dispositions good for? They're 
particularly good for controlling for biases, okay? So we'll get into all these, but uh, I wanna start by giving you just an example of, of how one could approach a charged issue using the critical thinking toolkit, okay? So here is an argument, right? This is a variation on arguments we've probably all heard over the last several months, um, but I've distilled it down to an argument about uh, how do we deal with, with coronavirus, right? We've been holed up in this house for months, going stir crazy, and the number of deaths from coronavirus keeps going up. So clearly, social distancing isn't working. Okay, this is an argument. I'm guessing most of the people who are joining us have an immediate reaction to this argument. Now, you may immediately agree with it. You may immediately disagree with it. But I would say to hold off on that opinion first, because the question is, why is this argument good or bad? Okay, what is, if something's wrong with the argument, what, what is it? Okay, and, and we could determine that using the critical thinkers toolkit. Okay, so we could start by taking some of those language skills I mentioned, because this is a prose argument, right? This is something that somebody might say to you by the water cooler or the virtual water cooler. You might read some version of it in a, in a newspaper editorial or a tweet or something, right? But this is not a structured argument. Okay, in order to work with it, we need to take this prose argument and turn it into structured language that we can analyze, okay? So step one is translation, okay? It's a translation process. This is the same argument, okay? This is the same argument we were looking at, okay? But I have translated it into a set of structured statements, okay? And those statements, if you know any logic, are called premises, you know, two premises leading to a conclusion. Okay, so that original argument, the prose argument, I sort of stripped aside some of the emotion and boiled it out to premise one, harsh social distancing practices have been in place for months. Premise two, during that time, the number of deaths from coronavirus has gone up. Okay, in conclusion, harsh social distancing practices are not stopping the spread of coronavirus. Okay, so, so step one was a language skill, right? We haven't applied logic yet, but we've taken the steps to translate an everyday argument in, in the language that we humans speak into something, into an argument that can be structured and analyzed. Okay, so once it's, once it's been structured, then we can put it through some tests. And the first test you put it through is a test called validity. Okay, and validity is basically a test that says, if I accept the premises as true, okay, if I accept the premises to my argument as, as all true, all of them, okay, can I still reject the conclusion or am I forced to accept the conclusion? Okay, if accepting the premises, in other words, if I accept our social distancing practice has been in place for months and during that time, the number of deaths has gone up, if I accept those two premises as true and I have no choice but to accept the conclusion, right? I can't come up with a counterexample. There's no way to reject the conclusion. Then the argument is valid. Okay, and so we'll try it here, right? In this case, the premises are easy to accept as true, right? Because they are both true, right? Our social distancing uh, practices have been in place for months and during that time, the number of deaths has gone up. Okay, so those are both true, but if I accept them as true, which is easy because they are true, do I have to accept the conclusion as true? Okay, and the answer is obviously not, right? There's all kinds of ways I can reject the conclusion even if I accept the premises as true, right? Because for instance, if, if you understand why social distancing was put in place, it was meant to flatten the curve, okay? It was meant to uh, reduce any, the number of people sick at any one time so it wouldn't overwhelm the healthcare system, right? So in fact, social distancing practices could stretch, probably would likely stretch out, out the time that it would take to deal with a virus, but it meant we would lower the number of deaths because we wouldn't have uh, people who died needlessly because the healthcare system couldn't keep up with it, right? So in this case, it's easy to reject the conclusion because I've got some background knowledge that allowed me to understand what social distancing was all about. So if I can accept the premises and reject the conclusion, then the argument is not valid. Okay, so we've just gone through analysis to understand why that original argument is wrong, okay? And I should note, this is not an opinion that this argument is valid, this is a fact. Okay, this is just as true as the factualness of our premises. And this is, a, this is a really important point. That's why I started a logic check because many people think all we have to do to sort of solve our problems is understand we have to check the facts. Are the facts true or false? 
But this case, this argument would have survived fact checking, right? Because as I just said, that the premises are true, they're factually correct. Okay, but they led to a false conclusion. The problem wasn't with the facts, the problem was with the argument. Now the problem could have been actually with my translation, right? Maybe I translated it in a way that was invalid. Okay, so I'm going to take another stab at it. In this case, I'm gonna translate it into a way that is valid. Okay, but the only way to do that is I have to extract from the argument what's called a hidden premise. You know, Aristotle referred to as an enthymeme. But many times our arguments hinge on hidden premises, often unstated, right? Uh, people who argue over abortion are really arguing over a def when does life begin, right? So those are examples of um, the, the hidden premise that might not even get brought up or might not even be realized by the people having a debate. Okay, so in this case, there's a hidden premise. I'm keeping the same first two premises, but I'm adding a hidden premise which says, social distancing practices should lead to an immediate reduction in deaths from coronavirus. Okay? And if I add that hidden premise, you'll notice that the argument's now valid. Right? If I accept premise one is true, and premise two is true, and premise three is true, then I cannot reject the conclusion. Okay? The, the conclusion, if I accept the three, three premises, I have to accept the conclusion. So this version of the argument is valid. Okay? But there's a second test that an argument has to go through to check if it's any good, and that's you know, that's a test of soundness. Okay, and soundness is you know before when I said you have to accept the premises as true. Well, that's a temporary measure, right? For the purposes of checking validity, you have to temporarily accept that all the premises are true. Whether or not you actually believe they're true, you must at least accept them long enough to see if they lead to the conclusion, right? Because if they don't, it doesn't matter if they're true or not. If they don't lead to the conclusion, the argument's invalid and it's no good, case closed. Okay, but this case, I purposefully created a valid argument to see if it exposed if any of the premises were bad. Okay, now the first two premises we just said, they're good, right? They're statements of fact, they're true. Our social distancing practices have been put in place, deaths have gone up during those time. I cannot reject the, the, those premises, but I can reject premise three for the same reason I showed that the argument was invalid next time, right? Because social distancing practices are not meant to create an immediate reduction in coronavirus death. They're meant to flatten the curve, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this argument fails, not because it's invalid, because it's, because it's unsound, okay? And if an argument fails because of lack of validity or lack of soundness, it fails, period. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean the conclusion of the argument is false, Okay, it simply means that the argument is not, is, is not proven the conclusion, right? Another argument might prove the conclusion, but this argument did not. Okay, so um, I'll take a quick pause. And Christine, were there any questions that popped up? Uh, yes, actually, there's a comment in chat from Mike. He writes, but we didn't have a goal stated for the social distancing, question mark. We didn't have a goal stated. Uh, Mike, do you want to unmute yourself and just uh, maybe clarify that a little? Um, sure. Um, it, it, it seems to me that, that we never had a goal or an objective to, to measure against. And, and without that, without some sort of metric, you know, there's no way we can pass or fail definitively. That's an, an excellent point. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, in that case, first, I think, you know, the goal, we did have a goal, but it changed, right? We initially had a goal to flatten the curve to make sure the healthcare system wasn't overwhelmed. And whatever you think of how coronavirus has gone, we seem to have succeeded in that front, right? There doesn't seem to be, you know, people dying in the streets because they couldn't get into hospital beds. Now, you know, the goal then sort of switched to, we, we were expecting that um, these distancing practices would um, eventually sort of stop the spread entirely or, that you know, new cases breaking out or acceleration of cases means social distancing has failed, which is, is may not be the case. We I don't have an argument to sort of, of construct that, but I would say probably the goal, there was um, ambiguity regarding the goals. If we'd stopped and said our goal was to flatten the curve, we could say mission accomplished, but clearly there was more, there's more things to be done for which social distancing is still a valid way of, of dealing with, with uh, the problem, but um, you know, but I would say that that this doesn't sort of impact 
the example because I was using this just an example, but it does show how um, you know how we define what a goal is is going to define success or failure of the measure. So that was a great question, Mike. Appreciate that. Is how do we know we've flattened the curve? Well, pardon? How do we know we have flattened the curve? Well, you know, potentially things can go up again, and we could overwhelm the healthcare system again. But when I'm talking about flattening the curve, I'm talking about that death, the sickness rates never got so high that hospitals had to sort of let people kind of die outside because they had no beds for them or there's no doctors. So I'd say, you know, generally the healthcare system struggled and there's all kinds of consequences to it. But I would say we didn't end up with a healthcare system that became overwhelmed. And if that's your goal, then, you know, social distancing worked. If your goal was to prevent future outbreaks of the virus, um, then, you know, we could debate whether it worked or whether social distancing worked or not. But I would say the goal, the goal of, so the goal of curve flattening was not to end the virus, but to keep any, uh, keep too many people from getting it at one time. But it does seem like we've made an assumption about cause and effect. Um, good point. I would say, yeah, I would say um, it certainly it seems as distancing practices have, have um, loosened infection, infection has gone up, but there's a number of variables we don't really um, fully understand. And again, I want to dwell, you know, as much on this argument other than to sort of use it as, as an example to illustrate sort of validity and soundness. But we can talk more about it uh, later on, Mike. Um, if, if, unless there's another question, Christine, can I? Can you can move on. on? Yep. Thank okay. you. Okay, good, because I want to bring up some other examples that I'm sure people will have some questions about. Uh, some of these are political, but these are examples of other ways that arguments can go wrong, right? I talked about uh, validity and soundness, right? Um, here's, a, here's a quote, right, of something that is called a fallacy, which is a sort of break in logic. You know, something's gone wrong with logic, okay? And this is a quote from a president who shall not be named, but uh, I will say it's a tweet, uh, if that gives you a hint. But this is a tweet that said, stock market hit another all-time record high yesterday. There's great confidence in the moves that my administration is making. Now, to be fair, you know, the current president is not the first person to claim that the stock market going up proves that he's doing a good job, okay? So, but this is fallacious, okay? This fallacious is just a fancy way of saying it's a fallacy. This is a fallacy, okay? And it might not be intuitive why it's a fallacy, but again, if we break it into a structured argument, it's got two premises, right? The premises, one is, if my administration's economic policy is successful, the stock market will go up. Premise two is the stock market has gone up. Therefore, my administration's economic policies are successful, okay? Okay, this is a, uh, an argument, it is, call, it is a fo called a formal fallacy, okay? The problem is with the structure of the argument, okay? And you'll see why it's wrong if I give you a, a, another simple example of, of an exa arguments that, that structure the exact same way, okay? Here's an argument, if it's raining, the street will be wet, okay? The street is wet, therefore it's raining, right? But there's all kinds of reasons a street could be wet, even if it's not raining, right? A street cleaning truck might have gone by, a water main might have broken, there might have been a flood two weeks ago and the street is still drying out, right? This is called um, affirming the consequent, you know, basically if, if it was, I was doing this in pure symbols, it would be if A then B, B therefore A, okay? And that's a fallacy, okay? Um, if you look at this question, if B, if A, my administration's economic policy is successful, then B, the stock market will go up. B, the stock market has gone up. A, my administration's policies are successful, okay? It is a, it is a structural fallacy, okay? And many, many arguments that you're gonna be, you've seen, you, are, you will see tomorrow, you'll see all year long during election year, okay? Suffer from structural fallacies, but many more of them suffer from what are called informal fallacies. Okay, formal fallacies are concerned with the structure of an argument. It doesn't really care what the words are. Okay, uh, that argument I just gave you would be a fallacy even if I just use A's, A's and B's. Okay, but informal fallacies, what you say is important, right? Here is, here is a, um, an informal fallacy called ad hominem. 
okay, which means to the man, which means we are attacking the person rather than the argument. Okay, in this case, this is a, uh, a crack that the president made about one of his uh, rivals during the Republican nomination, and he was making fun of how she looked, right? Okay, now there's a classic ad hominem attack, attacking somebody not for what you're arguing over or your political positions or anything, but attacking them for their features, okay? Um, the reason I, I like this, this one's very meta, of course, because the, whoever put this, this image together, I just sort of found this on the internet while looking for uh, informal fallacies, right? They, they intentionally found an unflattering picture of the man who said it, right? So this not only is what he said, an ad hominem attack, but whoever like used that quote against him built it into another ad hominem attack, okay? And there are actually like many, many more informal fallacies than there are formal ones, meaning a whole lot can go wrong more can go wrong with what we say than how we structure our argument, right? You can have argumentation from authority where you rely on authority figures inappropriately to um, make your case. You can use red herrings where you're trying to distract somebody from what they should be thinking about. Uh, there are dozens of fallacies and for every formal one, there's sort of three to five informal ones. I've got in, in Critical Voter, I've got a whole chapter or two chapters dedicated to fallacies including Mike, one you like on mathematical fallacies on how we treat numerical information. Um, so these are um, ones we can get into in Q&A if you want to know more. People love fallacies because they're fun and there's a lot of fun, funny examples of them. Um, I won't dwell on them, but again, there should be plenty of time later to talk about them. But I, I do want to stop and point out that uh, we've covered a lot of ground, right? And just those couple examples I've shown you, if Critical thinking consists of structured thinking, otherwise known as logic, language skills, argumentation, background knowledge. Just that first argument, that first coronavirus argument, gave you an example of all of these, right? And that, that's one of the sort of dirty little secrets of critical thinking, like to learn the knowledge, the stuff I just showed you, right? That's not everything, um, you know, but even if you took a course in the subject or, you know, read Critical Voter or another book on the subject, you could pick up this stuff in quite a short period of time. It takes a long time to get good at it because you have to apply it to a whole variety of situations we encounter in life. Okay, but um, you know, but it is the, the the methods are pretty um, straightforward and easy to learn. So I want to use you know what time's left to kind of show you a couple of other critical thinking skills and give you some examples of them, and then we'll have a bunch of time later for uh, for Q and A. Uh, what I want to make is persuasive communication, otherwise known as rhetoric. As I said, I sort of break somewhat with some other critical thinking folks who are not sure if rhetoric or persuasive language uh, is an appropriate fit with critical thinking. There are reasons for that. You know, um, critical thinking is often taught by philosophers and philosophy going back to Socrates has been at odds with rhetoric or rhetoricians. But, you know, as I mentioned, in order to understand real world arguments, you often have to peer through the rhetoric to get to the sort of nut of things beneath it, like you saw in that example. But also I would say in order to be persuasive yourself, if you've got sound, valid, logical, strong arguments, well, you know, no one's gonna pay any attention to them if they're not persuasive. So I, I've got sort of chapters on rhetoric, but I, I've time to sort of teach one um, quite uh, powerful technique in persuasion. And we're gonna try a poll here. I know Christine has been sort of working on a poll, see if we can get this going, but I want you to answer which of these arguments do you think is most effective? One is this administration has failed to protect the American people. The second is on my first day of office, I'll devote every available resource to make the crisis of today a thing of the past. And the third one is the American people are strong enough to withstand and grow stronger from adversity. So Chris, you wanna launch that poll? Poll launched. Okay, and we'll, Pop this up uh, for a minute or until everybody's uh, voted, but if it's on your screen, if you just want to pick. We're picking to what purpose? Uh, pick which one you think is the strongest argument, the most persuasive. And it is an anonymous poll, FYI. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're tied. Oh. Okay. 
Okay. Or, okay. Uh, that last one might be, uh, the last one might be me. I can't vote for the polls. So, okay. Interesting, interesting results. This is a chance you always take when you're, when you're, uh, doing polling because you don't always get the results you think you're going to. And I'll, I'll explain why I, uh, this actually, uh, I find this interesting is might be say something about the moment we are in. Um, but let's, I, I want to use this because each of these are examples of different type of argument. Okay. There are three different types of argument. And again, this goes um, kind of way back to, to Aristotle, like a number of, of things we've been talking about. One is a forensic argument. And forensic arguments are about the past. Okay, that's why the term forensic is, is used in forensic science, for example. Um, you, you, you're trying to reconstruct what happened in the past. Courtrooms often are where forensic arguments play out because you need to find out who done it, right? So you're trying to affix blame. That's what really forensic arguments are good for is to sort of identify who is in the wrong, okay? You can also have demonstrative arguments which are about the present. Usually it's about celebrating the present or celebrating people, kind of like that the American people are tough and resilient. Uh, you'll see this in funeral orations or maybe church sermons. Uh, we'll sort of celebrate people. It's, it's demonstrative arguments are good at bringing people together or sometimes sort of bringing people together in opposition of a sort of, of, of another. Um, and then the third type of arguments are deliberative arguments and those are about the future. Okay, that was that argument about, you know, on the first day of my administration, I will do this, that, or the other thing. That's in the future, okay? Forensic arguments take place in the past tense. Demonstrative arguments take place in the present tense. And deliberative arguments take place in the future tense. And I'm gonna make the case, and I'm not making this, this is not, you know, something I invented, that the most persuasive arguments, the most successful arguments, tend to be deliberative. I find it interesting that most people were persuaded by the forensic argument because in discourse, forensic arguments tend to um, get, people, get you sort of branded as um, kind of backwards thinking or most interested in blame, which, you know, in certain areas, and we may be in one now, uh, fixing blame is an important thing to do, right? It's never inappropriate to do, okay? But in general, if you wanna solve a problem, you want to make things better, you can't make things better in the past. You can only make things better in the future, right? So most quality or most persuasive, successful politicians, if you sort of look at their, their rhetoric, their, their arguments tend to be more in the future tense. And if you think of, um, of, of uh, politicians who are generally considered sort of optimistic, uh, generally considered successful, you know, John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan come to mind. If you look at their speeches, you'll find they tend to be more deliberative than politicians who may be less successful or more about sort of finger pointing or the past. And, and I'll, just to show you, this actually is not just about um, politics, right, in everyday life. Like, how are your kids gonna react to like, how many times are they gonna have to clean up it after you have you track mud in the house? Okay, versus in the future, could you leave your muddy shoes outside before you come in, okay? The first one is forensic. Why do you keep doing that? The second one is deliberative, okay? I, I've implemented this like in my house over the years that I've taught my kids to try to avoid the past tense, to use more deliberative argumentation. Why? Because it's proposing a solution in the future, right? And if anybody here has ever gotten like into an argument that began with the words, you never, or you always, I'm guessing, you know, from the smiles I'm seeing, those didn't go well. And now you know why, right? They were carried on in the wrong tense. Okay, so if you take something away from this, you know, it may be hard to sort of, of, of do this all the time, but I would say if, if you have a choice, um, try to make your arguments forensic as much as possible because we can improve things in the future. Okay, and the last piece I want to talk about is sort of dispositions because, you know, the reason dispositions are important is that they control for something that is one of the major distortions of our reasoning, and that is bias, right? We, we, we're living in an era, right, where our political, our politics are hyper-polarized. A lot of it has to do with emotion, kind of overwhelming reason. Also has to do with tribalism. You know, you've probably read dozens or hundreds of books and articles that talk about polarization in terms of emotional reasoning and 
the tribalism of the, of the electric, electorate. You know, but even if we can get sort of emotions under control, it turns out our reasoning itself is not so hot, right? Um, I don't know if anyone else has read this book, but I would highly recommend the wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, he was a researcher. He worked with another researcher called Amos Tversky in the 60s and demonstrated that our brains actually don't work like we think they do. They don't work with that sort of efficiency that we think they do. They take shortcuts. So shortcuts are called heuristics. And those heuristics can lead to biases. Okay, what's an example of a bias? Well, anchoring, for example. If I went into a classroom, uh, if I went into a, um, if I went into a classroom and I asked everybody, was Mahatma Gandhi 170 years old when he died? Okay, everyone would say no, right? They'd all get the question right. But then I say, okay, how old do you think he was when he died? Okay, and then I went to another classroom and I asked, did Gandhi die at 14, right? They would also know that was wrong and ask them to write how old they thought he was when he died. Okay, the first class, the one that was given 170 to start with, will come up on average with a much higher number of their guess as to when Gandhi died, much higher. Why? Because I anchored them. Okay, I put a number in their head. And so therefore, they were thinking, well, how much younger than 170 was Gandhi when he died? Whereas the other group, I put a much smaller number in, I put 14 in their head, and they're gonna think, well, how much older was he than 14 when he died? And as, as a result, I have, I've anchored them, okay? And this, this is used all the time to persuade or manipulate you, influence or manipulate you, right? Because um, when you, during an election season, right, it's in someone's interest to get Economic, good or bad economic news out immediately. Okay, any any news that'll help them, you know, they want it to get out immediately. Why? Because they want to anchor you in those numbers. They want to put those numbers in your head, so that all debate afterwards will be about how much higher or lower than this number I've anchored you with. Okay, so again, I said that's a way to, you know, either manipulate or influence. And manipulate influence is another example of a bias, which is framing, right? You know. The politician I like, he used numbers to influence people. The one I didn't like used them to manipulate people. You know, these are ways of framing an issue, an identical issue, okay? Uh, is, it, is, a, is it a tax hike or is it revenue enhancement? Is it, um, is healthcare reform a, is it healthcare reform or is it a, um, a, a, a health tax? Is it a death tax? or an inheritance tax. These are all ways of framing an issue. And the way an issue is framed can persuade you one way or another, okay? Um, there's two biases, uh, the rest of the biases I wanna illustrate, so I wanna go through them, but then I'll explain them more in um, an illustration. One is the availability heuristic. That's where information that's more top of mind will have more power over you. Like a conversation you had recently that you can remember might have more influence than a whole bunch of research you did six months ago. Also, the effect heuristic is how you feel about yourself, the day, that can impact your decisions, right? If it's a nice sunny day, people tend to buy more lottery tickets. Why? Because they associate good feelings with a, a nice weather with being lucky, okay? So, and then the granddaddy of all bias is confirmation bias. I'll, I'll spend some more time at the end, but let me just show you uh, this example on the effect and the uh, availability heuristic, because I'm, I'm working on a, a project now of trying to help uh, parents and students make decisions of where to go to college by using some of these techniques. And, and college decisions notoriously suffer from availability and effect heuristics, right? You know, you do all kinds of research in the fall, but your decision is based on a conversation you had with a friend who goes to a certain college at the last minute or the last place you visited has much more impact on you than other places you might have visited before. Or the weather's good. I just use that as an example by lottery tickets, but you know, every time I bring up like, you know, the the effect heuristic, people, everyone seems to have gone to a college they visited when it was sunny. I know I did. Okay. So, you know, one way of controlling this, this is your typical spreadsheet that a kid or parents and kids put together to cite on colleges. I just sort of uh, Hold it together. It's got all your typical names of schools and environment and admissions rate, et cetera. But I've also added a couple columns. You know, one is the, the date of the last contact, and one was the weather when I visited it. 
right? It might seem dopey, but just simply like acknowledging it, simply documenting it, simply you could say, you know, I want to go, you know, I don't want to go to Northeastern, even though I, I like it in every other aspect. Why might that be? Well, you know, I visited on a rainy day, you know, just even knowing that you can be influenced by the effect heuristic or the availability heuristic, just knowing that your brain is subject to these flaws and reasoning will make you cognizant of them and hopefully will make you sort of think critically uh, versus sort of, of following your instincts, which I said, your instincts might be influenced by these, um, by these chinks in our mental armor. Okay, and, and the reason I want to bring this up because we cannot eliminate bias in ourselves, they're part of the species. Okay, they're part of our brains. We don't know exactly where they came from, probably some form of evolution, but you can control for them. In this case, by some simple techniques of just understanding them, knowing how they influence you and generating information you could use to, uh, to navigate them. Now, the one I want to kind of point out most is confirmation bias. This is the bias which says you are more likely to believe facts and information that confirm what you already believe, and you are likely to reject information that uh, conflicts with what you already believe. This is completely natural. You know, people have done this for forever. Um, so, but, you know, there have been some changes in recent time, which I could say has probably led to what we have now is, is you know, it's not necessarily a crisis of fact, fake news, or even a crisis of tribalism, we could be facing a crisis of too much confirmation bias. Why? Because now, you know, we don't even share the same news stories, right? You've heard stories of people who are like, they watch the same event, but they watch it on one cable channel versus another. We seal ourselves in bubbles where we don't actually even have debates or conversations with people disagree with them. We may not even know people who disagree with us, or if we do, you know, we just join an online community where everybody agrees with us, right? So this is a perfect situation for um, shoring up what is sort of the greatest flaw in our reasoning, which is sort of confirmation bias. And, you know, to give you an example of this, like, you know, earlier in the year or all through this year since coronavirus, right, I, I'm presuming from the first argument I gave you, most people feel that at least, you know, whatever you think of social distancing, that gathering in huge groups is probably a bad idea, right? You probably think, that gathering in large groups during a time of pandemic is a, is a bad idea. And there have been examples, right? Early in the year, we had people protesting the lockdown itself and they were gathering in large groups and people were saying, you know, this is going to create an uptick in coronavirus crisis, right? Then we had the protests that occurred after the Floyd killing, okay? And there were stories there about how this is going to, uh, this good, good, uh, um, in increase the spread of coronavirus, okay? Now, if you believe that gathering in large crowds is a bad idea, okay, then you should believe that both these stories or, or both of these large gatherings increase the risk of infection, right? But if you find yourself thinking, well, you know, let me look, these guys aren't wearing masks, but I think, you know, some people in this photograph are wearing masks. But wait a minute, this protest only took place over a couple of days, or is these ones are going over for months. If you're looking for some reason to say, this was a health risk, but this wasn't, or this is a health risk, this wasn't, it's probably coming from something other than reason, because that's maintaining a contradiction in your head. If, if coronavirus is going to increase if you have large crowds, it's going to increase if you have large crowds, regardless of why those large crowds have, 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 have been gathering. Now, one can make a perfectly reasonable argument, or at least an argument of one debating, that one of these issues meant is means should take precedent over, um, or it's, it's, it's so important that we should take the extra risk of gathering to protest either racial injustice or economic sort of, of, of um, crisis from, from lockdown. Okay, those are reasonable arguments to make, but they're not the same as saying one of these is safe and one of these is, is unsafe. Okay, and if, if, you're, if you find yourself believing one but not the other, probably it is, it is confirmation bias um, informing that, um, as opposed to gravitating towards our creating an argument that justifies why one of these is reasonable to do, even though it could increase the risk of virus. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that like, you know, confirmation bias, this, is, this just sums up, you know, confirmation bias in social media, you know, you're right and everyone else is wrong, okay? But the reason I wanna bring it up is that, um, you know, 
I, I would say, you know, our polarized politics, as I pointed out, is a um, is suffering from, you know, too much unchecked bias. Uh, critical thinking is not going to eliminate bias, but as you saw, even in the few examples I showed you, it gives you a set of tools to at least understand and control for it, right? And one of the reasons you should do so, even during a heated election season, right? I was struggling with Christine before, and I've been I've been doing this for for you know using election politics, teach critical thinking skills, and during election during election time, particularly right before, you know the weeks before election, no one wants to hear it, right? They, they actually get sort of angry when I bring it up. But you know, I, I point out that like bias can not just get in the way of of kind of understanding of the world, understanding other people. It can get in the way of you like actually achieving your goals. And I'll just leave you this one example because I think some of you are, are kind of both old enough to remember um, Gary Hart, right? The Gary Hart was sort of my first political crush, right? It was 1984, he was running in the primary, he broke from the pack, and um, it looked like he might beat out Walter Mondale for the nomination for Democrat, but he, he didn't. But like when he came back to run in 1988, he was the front runner, and I was all in for Hart. I thought Hart was great. I was ready to vote for him, I was campaigning for him. And when rumors started to float that he was having extramarital affairs, I refused to believe them. Okay, why? Because those conflicted with my belief about what a great guy Gary Hart was, right? So, but if enough biased people like me won the day and Gary Hart got to be the nominee, everything that, all the rumors, which turned out to be true, probably would have come out during the election and he would have lost. In other words, my bias could have helped me like lose the very thing that I was was hoping for, in that case, a, an election victory. You know, so I bring it up because you better hope that like there's some people in, if, if you know, if you're a Trump supporter, you better hope there's some people in the Trump campaign that understands Joe Biden is not just, you know, however he's portrayed in the negative ads they run. If you're in the Biden campaign, you better like stop and appreciate that there might be something to Donald Trump's rhetoric, for example, not just assume sort of he's an ignoramus or uh, Joe Biden is sort of over the hill. You really better kind of understand their real strengths and their real weaknesses. Otherwise, your bias might lead you to lose. Okay. And, you know, with that sort of note, I just want to kind of leave that um, I've got, uh, you know, a bunch of, of a few links I can leave you, but now I just want to, uh, Take any questions that have been in the in the chat, or if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask some. And and I don't know if this was time to how long this go, but I can I can do this all night. So if anyone has some questions they want to bring up, please fire away. Uh, I'll go. I'll go for another one, uh, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. This is um, Mike again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, could you just comment, um, I'm, I'm an engineering guy, mm -hmm. could you comment on the relationship between critical thinking and systems engineering and the scientific method? Sure, yeah, actually, um, you know, crit critical thinking has certainly probably would not have come about without the scientific method. If you read Dewey's How We Think, he was really talking about applying scientific reasoning to all subjects, which means uh, proposing a hypothesis and testing it to prove it wrong. You know, that's a, a slimmed down version of the scientific method. So, you know, in some ways it can be considered um, sort of application of scientific reasoning to everyday affairs. I, I would say it's sort of diverged since Dewey's days because um, if you think about it, critical thinking is, can solve things that science can't. Right, that if, if I have to decide, let me take a simple example. You know, there's a, a town that just got a big donation to the school band and they could either use that money to buy new band uniforms or send the kids off to the Rose Bowl, right? So there's no scientific experiment we could do to see which one of those is the right answer, right? It involves choices, it involves values, it involves predictions about the future. You might say, well, we buy the new band uniforms, those will last for many, many years. That's certainly a val scientifically valid, true thing to say. We could say, 
if the kids go to the Rose Bowl, that will increase the popularity of the band and more people will join and we'll get more donations later. Well, we don't know that's true. That's in the future, right? So we have to make some decisions and we have to use other methods to evaluate arguments other than scientific reasoning. And I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, I get in this debate all the time with scientists and engineers who wonder why, why can't we solve our social and political problems like we solve our scientific ones, right? Try something. If it doesn't work, try something else. Um, you know, why can't we sort of, of solve our, our problems like we, you know, uh, build a bridge? And the answer is, you know, we are human beings, right? We're not marbles rolling down inclined planes. You know, we're complicated. We're um, certainly reasoning people. We're also emotional people and we're also connected people. So when you're making decisions, it's often as uh, factors that relate to not just straight sort of, of um, cognitive function. Um, an example I like to use is, is child rearing, right? When, when you raise your kids, you um, don't simply sort of, of, you know, apply the scientific method to uh, kind of, of, you don't put probes on their head to see if they're sad or tired or something. You, you understand, you, you read them because you know them and you love them. You have this emotional connection with them. This we call an ethos bond. And that, that gives you valuable information that you use to make parenting choices, some of which will be maybe based on, you know, scientific practices of child rearing or instinct, right? So, so we as human beings um, should certainly, you know, think more rationally, use techniques like science uh, when they're appropriate. But, you know, one thing I always have to dispel is this notion that being a critical thinker means we have to turn earth into planet Vulcan, right? You have to become Mr. Spock. You know, that, that is not the case. Um, you know, critical thinking does rely on reason, certainly, but not reason alone. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, thank you. Sure. What else we got? Steve. Hi, thanks for the th oh, I'm Steve. Hi. Hey, Steve. Thanks for the thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I guess I like I really like what you're. I, I guess I try not being very uh, very uh, literate here. So, like, is it your view that like? If the, this is a critical thing for our society to do, to embrace critical thinking, to teach the kids and all of us learn all of these different kind of techniques so that when we're engaged citizens, like mm -hmm. all of the dysfunction and the whole mess we're in now will be greatly alleviated or like part of me thinks this is great and part of me thinks that like why, why this is just, you know, we've got a president who doesn't, you know, who's got 20,000 lies and people don't, you know, all the people just watch Fox News or MSNBC or whatever. But this is just kind of a nice academic little exercise that you're doing, but it's not going to move the needle. And I just can't, I can't decide whether I think this is critically important or just not going to, not going to, not going to make a difference. And I, I don't know, sorry, I just, that was my reaction to your talk. Yeah, I mean, obviously my goal is the former, right? I, yeah, I yeah. think this is what's missing. Um, and it's obviously, you know, um, missing even more than it has since I, you know, it's really been sort of several election cycles. I've been doing something like this and um, things seem to be getting worse and worse. But, you know, I, uh, but I would say in a way that just proves the point, right? We've, we've not embraced these principles. We don't practice critical thinking not just techniques, but dispositions. We don't stay open-minded. We're even less concerned with what people who disagree with us might think. We're not empathetic. Um, and I would say, you know, I can't think anybody feels more empowered over that. Uh, I would say one of the reasons we're getting, not just, you know, the president we have, but the candidates who have gotten over the last several elections is because we've like, We've abandoned. We don't want the, we don't want candidates to, you know, get up and have an actual substantive argument about, you know, issues. We punish them if anybody stops and say, I don't have the answer to that. Let me think about it. You know, we have all these criteria that we're evaluating people based on, um, and they're not sort of critical thinking criteria. So personally, I would say one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in right now is we haven't embraced these techniques. We haven't taught them. Uh, we don't live by them enough. I mean, not everybody. Some everybody does them to some extent about you know certain parts of their life, but certainly 
politically, it's gotten worse and worse. And I think that's made it very, very difficult for us to hold up our end as democratic citizens, right? It's not just the president's fault or the Congress's fault or the last president's fault, right? The less we do this, the more we're going to fall prey to people whose only skill is to manipulate. And I would say there's a reason we've gotten into the situation now. And if we want to get out of it, the solution is not to do more of it, you know, is not to, you know, critically think even less, you know, that'll solve our problems. It's to critically think more. And um, I just, you know, can't imagine that e even if these skills, you know, don't necessarily transform society, right? That's, that's, you know, my wildest dream that this will sort of, of everybody will embrace this, get good at it, and our politics will become more healthy. But let's, you know, let's say even if you use these techniques to decide what washing machine to buy, right, or or where to go to school, that example there, if you use, the, if you use these techniques to make better personal decisions, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. And personally, I think if you get some success in it, you have one less argument with a loved one because you think, oh, I better not use the phrase, you never, or you always, you know, you make a better choice of which job to take because you, you know, plotted it out in some kind of logical argument, right? It's like, oh, that worked. Maybe I'll use this for something else. And maybe you'll leave a good point. Maybe, you know, even though all my dispositions, I have political beliefs and I feel strongly about them, why don't I put them to the test? Why don't I question my beliefs and see if I really do believe them as strongly as I do? Let me challenge them. Let me argue with somebody who disagrees with me and have an honest argument about it, you know, is, might that be better than just screaming at each other or ignoring each other or never even like knowing somebody who disagrees with me exists or jumping on Twitter, you know, which is the worst invention in human history for, for having like substantive arguments, you know, um, try it out, you know, find somebody who, you know, disagrees with and rather than, you know, politely never talking politics because, you know, it'll get ugly, you know, have a substantive debate about sort of the most important issues of the day. I'm not sure why that's such a crazy thing to hope for, but I appreciate that question, Steve. I hope I've convinced you. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. Roseanne, go ahead. What do you think is the reason there is so many people that are not embracing critical thinking right now? That is a great question. I, I think there's like a bunch of factors. Um, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely like I've heard there's some conspiracy theories that like, um, you know, the, the sort of the government doesn't want people to think critically because, um, you know, then they'll think for themselves. I, I think, you know, a few things. One is you know, it, it used to be to be an educated person, like from, from the Greeks, all the way to like a hundred years ago to be an educated person meant you studied logic and you studied rhetoric, you studied grammar, the sort of trivium. These were the core subjects to be an educated Roman, to be an educated person in the middle ages, right? But the last 200 years, there's been this explosion of knowledge, right? So when the modern curriculum was sort of codified, which happened about a hundred years ago, right? We had science and social studies and language and mathematics. There wasn't any room for those old subjects anymore. And there's nothing wrong that, that we're learning math and science, obviously, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing, but it does mean the old subjects were sort of pushed out of the curriculum and then they, that meant no one's learning them. I think that's one factor. I think, you know, if you look at sort of state standards, state academic standards, you'll see that sort of critical thinking is um, um, embraced and um, most of the moderns, I, I do a lot of work with standards and most modern standards are very, very, um, embracing of critical thinking skills. And most teachers, you know, and college professors, if you ask them, you know, list your top three priorities, getting kids to become critical thinkers will be one of the top three. So, so there's, there's plenty of enthusiasm for doing it. But if you ask employers, like how many, how many kids are you getting, how many of them think critical, think critical, 75% will say that they don't, right? So there's a huge gap between the enthusiasm and the desire and, and what's actually delivered. And, and that's what a lot of my work in is in education is trying to close that gap, right? I won't dwell on it, but you know, if you read the sort of MIT book, it sort of talks about how there's different tip methods for teaching critical thinking. And it turns out we use the wrong ones. We use ones that, you know, they're not terrible, they're better than nothing, but they're not the most effective way to teach critical thinking to young people. So I think that's one factor. I, I think the other factor is, you know, 
kids could learn critical thinking in the classroom. And I'm, you know, hoping my work kind of and the work of other people leads to that. But then they also have to learn critical dispositions outside of school. And that means, you know, if a kid has grown up in a dogmatic household, uh, probably that's going to be a break on their future success because that's um, not sort of a teaching that, that that doesn't give them an opportunity to think critically. Obviously, our current, our present state where the medium for communication uh, doesn't really uh, support uh, substantive communication between people who disagree. You know, I'm talking about social media particularly, but even a lot of sort of, of modern communication is that systems. I think that's sort of, of causing these problems. So, so I wouldn't say there's um, anybody standing in the way of it. I would say there are factors why we're not teaching it, even though everybody in the education system thinks it's important. And I think there are factors outside of school that sort of make it difficult for people to kind of know where to start. Um, and, you know, as I said, I think there's, um, it's too bad because it doesn't take that long to learn the skills. Um, I think the original curriculum that I created was about 12 hours worth. It does take quite a while to get good at it. You have to put it in practice. But like I said, the more you do it, the more good things will happen to you. And therefore, hopefully, the more you'll do it. So, so I hope, you know, everybody here will sort of, whether it's you know, through the books I've, I've showed you or any other book or course out there, um, at least take the plunge and give it a try because I don't think you have anything to lose and there's a lot to gain. Yep. Just quickly, what was the, what is the best way to teach it to young people that we're not going with? Uh, okay, so this, I'll do this, this uh, quick rundown. There's there's a, a research, a critical thinking researcher named Dr. Annis, who more than 20 years ago he proposed that there are three ways to teach critical thinking. One is called um, general approach to critical thinking, and that's where you have a critical thinking course, right? And you get that in in at college in, U, in U.S. colleges, particularly state colleges, you might have a standalone critical thinking course. And the course might pick from different subjects, you know, newspapers, uh, advertisements, science papers, et cetera, but they're really teaching critical thinking course. That's the general approach. That is the, either you look at it, that's the second best or the second worst way of teaching critical thinking. The worst way of teaching it is called immersion, where you include critical thinking in the teaching of traditional subjects like English, like math, like science. Okay, but you do it, um, um, you don't do it explicitly, you do it implicitly. So this would be like a teacher teaching a complex subject. Um, you know, a smart teacher teaches a complex subject and they assume critical thinking is coming along for the ride. I think that's how we're teaching critical thinking in K-12 mostly. That's why, that's why most teachers think that they are dedicated to teaching critical thinking and their students are learning it because they're teaching concepts that have sort of critical thinking behind them, but they're not teaching critical thinking explicitly. The best way to teach it is called infusion, where you do teach it explicitly. The example I like to use is when a math teacher teaches um, um, geometric proofs, right? That is That happens to be an example of deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is a vital critical thinking technique that students should learn, right? How many math teachers stop and say, by the way, that mathematical proof, that geometric proof we just did, that's an example of deductive reasoning. Right, that's the infusion method. And from there, you could build out on it and say, well, and deductive reasoning is different from inductive reasoning. That's the form of reasoning used in science. And let your science teacher explain to you that, right? So you have kind of transfer between different subjects. That's, that's what we don't do. That's the sort of, of kind of educational mission I'm on is to get the infusion method sort of integrated into kind of K-12 education. Because, you know, I mean, the good news is everybody thinks critical thinking is, is important, right? There's nobody saying critical thinking is unimportant. I don't want anybody to be able to do it and I don't want to teach it. They all say, I think it's really important and I'm already doing it. They just aren't using the right methods. So I would say, I don't know if you're a teacher, Steve, or if you know teachers, but you know the way to do it is through this method of infusion where you actually explicitly teach them. And I'm not sure why that should be a surprise, right? If you want students to learn something, you should teach it to them. You should explicitly teach it to them. No one would say, why do we bother teaching math? They'll get all that in physics, right? You know, because physics is very mathematical. So why would you think, well, they'll get critical thinking when they write an, an argumentative essay, 
without being taught what an argument is. So that's the, that's the high speed answer to your question. And I'm happy to, to talk more about that. I'm gonna share a screen it again to sort of like pop up my contact. Very so. much in the way of, of critical thinking. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, um, I missed that. I was just uh, popping up some contact. And was that another question, Alan? Oh, I was just wondering, it, it, it seems like religion is the opposite of critical thinking, that, that many religions don't want critical thinking. Uh, well, you know, that's, there are as, there's certainly like religions have aspects of them that can't be proven, you know, using the sort of proofs I showed you. Uh, um, you can't prove the existence of God, for example, using um, one of those logical proofs, or, or people have tried, you know, they're not very successful, you know, so you have to do that with a leap of faith, you know, but don't, don't forget you know, a lot of these sort of print, critical thinking principles um, derive from medieval scholars who were all, you know, highly religious, uh, early scientists, uh, the people who developed the concept of science and what evolved into the scientific method were um, people who felt they were trying to understand, you know, how God had sort of designed the universe. So there's not necessarily, um, they're obviously, you know, believing something in, on faith uh, is going to collide with believing something based entirely on logic. But, uh, you know, as I just talked before, you can't, you can't sort of do everything with logic anyway. You can't raise children with, with just logic anyway. So I, I would, I would sort of, of throw lane say, you know, there's, it's certainly reasonable for people of religious, people with religious beliefs to be strong critical thinkers. Um, interestingly enough, you know, I talked before about that sort of, of ancient curriculum, logic, rhetoric, um, et cetera, that goes back to sort of Greeks and Romans. The place where that's actually still taught, interestingly enough, is in the homeschooling movement, the, particularly the religious homeschooling movement, because they feel they're, that they're the inheritors of that tradition. So I, I'd be a little careful on sort of, of uh, just because, you know, religion requires you to take certain things on faith, presume uh, all religious people are irrational on all subjects. I think uh, that, that's one worth debating and, and, and keeping an open mind on. And we could argue that if you like, but, uh, there, there, there are folks, you just have an example of two people having a, uh, we're probably not going to get into it, but two people have an argument over a point um, that is perfect, where both of us have perfectly reasonable opinions, and we could debate this further, and you could sort of be swayed one way or another. So thank you for having an argument with me. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? We can stay maybe another 10 or 15 minutes if there's more to discuss. So a follow-up question. You'd mentioned the modern, modern curriculum codified 100 years ago kind of pushed out some of the old practices. Mm -hmm. What do you think were some of the things pushed out that if they were to be in the curriculum now would help with critical thinking? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not advocating, I mean, the 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 modern curriculum was actually like invented up the street at Harvard in, um, I think it was end of the 19th, early 20th century with a group called the Committee of Ten. You know, if you want to, I mean, it wasn't a conspiracy, it was done in, in bright daylight, but this group got together and devised what the modern curriculum would look like. And literally we're still living under that sort of, of framework. That's why we have, you know, X number of years of math, X number of years of English. Now that's, it's evolved considerably over those hundred years of how those categories define, but it's still very um, constructed that way. Um, and, and I'm definitely not saying, let's get rid of social studies and have a logic class instead. I think that would be actually a bad thing because it turns out the best way to teach critical thinking skills is within the existing curriculum, right? So, you don't need to tear apart the existing curriculum and start over. You can, you can um, infuse the English class with critical thinking skills. You can infuse the math and the science class. And that doesn't mean every single day you have to cover a critical thinking topic, right? That geometric proof example I just gave you, yes, you know, when the math teacher is te teaching geometric proofs, you should use that as an opportunity to teach about deductive reasoning, but you don't have to, there's no critical thinking skill necessarily associated with subtraction, 
Okay? You know, same thing in reading. If you're reading sort of poetry for the aesthetic value, you don't necessarily have to sort of both add a critical thinking skill, but if you're like writing a persuasive essay, you sure better know validity and soundness and persuasive communication. So I'd say, um, you know, the curriculum probably is, you know, could stand with a little bit of loosening, particularly in K-12 now. I don't know, know if all subjects have to look exactly like they did 100 years ago, but, you know, but they've grown and evolved and the way my kids are learning English is much different than the way I was taught English. And, you know, I would say not worse, in some cases better on that. But I would say the thing that's still missing is take those subjects that everybody used to know, like, you know, logic, rhetoric. You know, if, if I use the phrase like, you know, um, affirming the consequent, which I did before with that um, tweet example, right? 150 years ago, everybody would know what I'm talking about. Now, very few people would know what I'm talking about. And that's a real argumentative basic. It's not even necessarily vital for everybody to know all the vocabulary, you know, but it's missing, right? Nobody knows it. I'll take that back. Actually, some people know it. Like advertisers understand persuasive communication. The politicians understand cognitive biases and heuristics, right? So people who want us to do what they want, they're aware of these skills. So why, I just don't know why, unless we're sort of, you know, self-destructive, why we don't want to learn them also. Does that help? Yep, thank you. Seeing no more questions and hearing no more voices, I think um, we can wrap this up unless somebody wants to jump in. Um, thank you very much, Jonathan, for this presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program, I did record this and I will be putting it up on our YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow or Wednesday. So if you wanna revisit the concept or if you wanna direct anybody you know to start thinking about these things, I will be sending out the link to the video so you'll be able to share that as you like. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for participating in the discussion. And again, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks everyone for being here and obviously love talking about this. So if anybody wants to get in touch, my uh, contact info is above. Oh, and, and uh, if you're interested in buying the book, I should mention uh, um, the Concord Bookshop is a place you can get the, uh, the MIT critical thinking book. So support your local bookstores. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Have a okay. good night, everyone. Thanks for seeing. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.